That's adorable. This is SPTTV. Hello, everybody. Here I am uh, one week later from the uh, first time I did the live introducing my mother series. So thank you, everybody. Let me just go up and take a look at the chat. I know there's people that are It's probably just sending out uh, notifications now. So if everyone wouldn't mind um, hitting the like button and all that, hopefully it helps send out notifications and more people can engage in the chat tonight. So that'd be really great. Um, I'm just going to kind of take a minute, um, let everybody kind of get uh, settled in, uh, let some other people kind of get on board. I see people are starting to pop in and watch now, so I really appreciate everybody that's here. Um, and uh, just to kind of establish the ground rules, very similar to if you watched my video last week, um, I'm open to um, hard questions. Um, I'm open to criticism. I'm open to uh, contributions um, to the the conversation and uh, in any way you um, see fit. Um, I would ask that um, as we're going through this, it'll be a similar format where we will, I'll show a video of um, my mother and I interacting. And if you do have questions and uh, we started to get quite a lot of them last time, just mark it with question during the video and I'll try to star um, a certain number of them. Um, I need to just because some people do super chats, I'll try to prioritize those, but I don't want you to feel like uh, I'm not gonna try to answer questions if you wanna put them in there. I'm not doing this really to make money. I'm doing this to get the word out about my mother and her story and our family's story. And I think that that is important. I would just ask anyone uh, in your uh, questions and comments, if you can keep them respectful, we'll try to have an open and positive dialogue. That's what I'd like to try to do. Um, obviously, if somebody's a troll or they're just causing trouble, um, probably going to get tossed out. Uh, so kind of the same thing here. I see quite a few people starting to check in. Um, one thing I thought would be kind of fun, um, just uh, for a proof of life for everybody, is I thought that I would call my mama, uh, mom Rosemary, and I'm sitting here all tongue-tied, I apologize, and just let her say hi to everybody before we start. Um, because I do these pre-recorded, it's a lot to try to you know, work out something so that she could be involved in all this. And I don't want her to deal with that stress. I'm sitting here stressing about it myself. I don't think it's good for her. So let me give her a call. I'm just going to put her on speaker so she can say hi. And then after that, I will get going. So I'm not just going to waste y'all's time, but I figured everyone would just like saying hi to her. So, um, all right, let me see if I can do this. Let's see. Hope everybody can hear it in the chat. Hi, Mom. Hey, Mom. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. So we're going to do this live. I guess you're probably watching uh, over um, at your place, but I thought we'd call and say hi and let you say hi to everybody before we get rolling. Yes, I'm watching. <laughs> this is so exciting. I, I just wanted to say thanks to everybody for watching. And Mike, thanks for doing this. All right. Thanks, Mom. Yeah, have a great evening. All everybody. right, I'll, <laughs> yeah. All right, well, I'll talk to you after I'm done, okay? All right, bye. Bye. All right, cool. Anyway, um I don't I don't know if that uh, felt cheesy, but I wanted this to be um my chance to share her story and I thought that um I was trying to do this in such a way that she, so she's interacting with it. So, um why not? Um so there you go. No, try not to be too terribly gimmicky, but all right. So what we're going to get into tonight, we had kind of in the last video episode one, um, went up through the entire process of her being in the hospital after she had gone through, um, kind of, we did kind of an overview of her, um, the general abuse that she went through as a senior. And then the process of her, you know, being stuck in this building in Los Angeles, that actually a lot of the protesting that's going on is focused specifically on the, that location. And um, at the end of that, she was then in the hospital, I had then come to see her um, from where I am uh, located in the military and just try to be with her. And, and then uh, meanwhile, like Scientology had more or less the control over her at that point. Um, she had signed over all of her power of attorney medically uh, and everything she had to their medical liaison officers. And um, anyway, it was, it was kind of a horrible situation where we left off. Uh, today, we're going to take it from there where she then goes into uh, hospice. They put her in a recovery situation. And then uh, she kind of explains what it was like to move from this mindset of a very dedicated um, Sea Org member to somebody that is now outside of the Sea Organization um, and is able to kind of deprogram herself and what that looked like. And then we talk a little bit about the escape and getting her out of there. 
But before we did that, I'm just going to give you all uh, a little bit of geography for those that are not as familiar with the location itself, um, where uh, this whole um, LA, they call it the PAC base. It stands for Pacific Area Command. Let me just pull it up here on the screen and go over to my little navigating area. This is uh, kind of the greater Los Angeles area and apologize for not looking at the screen. I'm kind of looking off on my second monitor. This is LA. Um, you can see LA is LA's huge. Um, this, this whole thing would be considered like the greater Los Angeles area. It is absolutely massive. And part of what I want to show you is how insignificant Scientology kind of is. Um, down here is where their little base is. Um, so if you kind of have the bird's eye view, you know, all the way out when she, the hospital where she was actually located, Hollywood Presbyterian is just down the street from where this place is. And this uh, complex, as they refer to it, or the PAC Pacific Area Command Base, I've taken and done some little graphics to kind of show people what's going on with that. That's what that sucker looks like. So the protests that have been going on on L. Ron Hubbard Way, if anyone's tuned in for Laura FN, most of the time she starts in this area along here, and then she kind of walks up and down these roads and tries to engage with people and see what's going on. So when she was, when my mother, Rosemary, was being kept in this building, this is where she was put on the rehabilitation project force, where she spent six years. They live in the bowels of this building. And that is, that was her life for six straight years, not really moving out of that location, living in the basements of that building and doing construction work in and around that area. Um, now, where she was physically located when she was working, she was in the Advanced Organization of Los Angeles. That is this building right here. Um, AOLA is what they refer to it as, Advanced Organization Los Angeles. And you can there's a little side parking lot. And she worked in this building. I've, I've kind of marked right in here this uh, yellow line. This is actually an underground tunnel. I'm not trying to sound all crazy QAnon. This is no shit, a tunnel that exists in there. This is an underground tunnel that connects this building and kind of the eastern complex to the main building complex. And the staff can walk back and forth. So as these protests are happening, they are still like moving back and forth, even though they blocked out all the windows around here so no one can actually see in or out. When Rosemary was living on that second floor, stuffed in that mechanical room where she was physically located, is this their dining hall is in this location. And this is the second floor of that main building and her room was a mechanical room that then adjoined a room down here and i'm just going to put you guys on street view so you can kind of get an idea of what that looks like here um we'll kind of zoom in on it so her room would have been right up in this area but she didn't have the room with the window she was like a deeper into the building itself and that's kind of where she physically was so i think that's kind of interesting as we kind of look at this building here it looks pretty nice outside and then you can see how all the windows are blocked off so that they can't, they don't have to look at the people walking around outside that want to have a conversation with them. You can see everything is closed off, but it's like an anti of inside. So mom would go and she would live inside this. This When she was stuck in that second floor for months and months and months, this was her life. And then if they did let her go to her job, she would come down, she'd go through the tunnel system over to this building over here. And sometimes she never got fresh air for months. It's... I know I'm sounding hyperbolic, but it's actually 100% true. It is craziness. Um, but yeah, that is more or less this location in a nutshell. I'm going to be doing other videos where I actually give everyone a tour, but you can see how small and insignificant they actually are. So when she had to be gotten to the hospital, it was Hollywood Presbyterian right over here. And then when she had to actually get uh, moved into the hospice that we're going to talk about, that's a location over here in Glendale. Um, so you can see the difference from one location to another. Here's Glendale. There's the uh, location in Hollywood. It's actually Los Angeles County, um, but everyone knows it as Hollywood because of, you know, kind of what it is, but it's actually LA County. And this is Los Angeles International Airport, just so you get some geography of what's going on in the area. As big as, this is one of Scientology's biggest locations. As big as they are here, they're actually so insignificant, it's barely even worth mentioning. So I just wanted to uh, lay that in there. Um, and then again, we're going to be starting off in uh, kind of where we left her off in the hospital. I did um, put in my um, little uh, community statement that I put out, and I'm not just going to ignore it. I know there's a whole lot of uh, drama going on uh, based off of a, a very hurtful letter that was sent 
uh, by a lawyer of the Aftermath Foundation to my friend, Miriam Francis. I do have a comment about that. What I'd like to do is continue to, um, I'm going to answer some questions, um, obviously about this video. And if people have questions about that, I, I don't have many things to say other than kind of a statement on that. But Miriam and I have been working together and we are very close friends. So I will kind of go over that a little bit when we're done, um, have a little mention of it just so I'm not um, burying uh, that as a topic. I know it's a very hot topic for me, um, but I know Miriam is, uh, has some stuff that she's going to be getting after on that, but I'm not going to ignore the thing. I just want to do this work first and then we'll get into that a little bit later. All right. I think I have yammered for uh, entirely long enough. It's been about 10 minutes. Uh, so let me go ahead and get this out of here and hand you guys over to mom. Every time I could. And then you and I said our goodbyes at the end of that when I had to go because I had a job to get back to and the family and everything. It was like, you know, mom, I don't know that we'll ever see each other again because we still thought you were going to pass away. You were still in the ICU. But you ended up being between the ICU and rehabilitation floor for over a month. Yeah. Where you stayed in Hollywood Presbyterian. So what was different about the medical care you were receiving while you were in the hospital? What did you end up finding out was wrong with you? What was, you, you know, and ultimately you started to do better. So just in just a couple words, um, just for the sake of time, just explain how you, <clears throat> what happened with when you were getting the medical care in the hospital and how did you start getting better? Well, first of all, it gave me oxygen. That's always great. <laughs> That's what Highly I really encouraged. needed. So that gave me a boost, apparently, you know, then, you know, keeping me there and then it oxygenated my body. And then they started giving me the water pills and it takes your body about three weeks maybe to start getting rid of all that to the, for the swelling to go down. You're also on some antibiotics too. Do you remember, the, was there something else wrong with you Yeah, at the time? I had pneumonia. Oh, okay. You know, so I had pneumonia and then I was dehydrated. And um, the biggest thing is I could just remember it was so, I, my legs were still swollen when I got to that uh, hospice place. They put you in hospice because you couldn't stay in the hospital anymore. You were good enough to discharge, but they still expected you to pass away. I so guess they, so. Or they, that, I guess they did because they were paying for you to go to this facility. Uh, though it wasn't a great facility, it was basically like a board and care hospice facility where yeah, people it was a, go. Yeah, it was just a house. It was a house that was, was being six, run. six old people in it that they were taking care of. And they being just a private company that was like... Yeah, they were... A, Armenian family? Armenian. They, it was run by Armenians, and they talked Armenian between them. You couldn't understand what they were saying unless they talked English to you. This is in Glendale. It's just a house in the middle of a neighborhood. Yeah. What did it feel like being there after you've been oh, in, I, in this year first, for so long? They brought me, like I was still so weak mm -hmm. when I left Presbyterian rehab. Uh, somehow I got through the rehab. I could just barely walk on a walker a little bit. Yeah. And then they got me there. They, I came in an ambulance on a gurney to my room. I, I could sit up in bed but I couldn't walk. Like I couldn't walk from here to there without, anyway, so then I, Dr. Lee got me that walker. When I first got there, I was totally afraid. I was totally afraid, like in fear. Of the caregivers? Of just not being in the Scientology complex. So you were fearful? Of, of the caregivers, of like I didn't trust them. Okay. And I didn't trust like being out in in uh, regular life, now, like without being in Scientology. And I I would call Adrian crying, telling her I want to go to the medical house, and she said, "You have to get better before you can come to the medical house." That was the only. She said, "Just keep giving yourselves yourself uh, locationals every day." <coughs> She just wanted to, yeah, they just, just wanted to shut me up. They thought you were out of sight, out of mind at that yeah, point. Yeah, they thought I had dimension. It was just, um, so so that, that house, I remember from the outside, it's in kind of just a kind of a suburban neighborhood. It's not super large, yeah. um, but at least had landscaping and stuff around it. It wasn't ugly. Yeah. Um, inside, was it clean? 
Um, yeah, like, it was okay. They used to mop every day. Yeah. They had hardwood floors, no carpet. Right. And they would mop it every day. So I, was it was it more luxurious than what you were used to when you were uh, in? It was so much like compared to what I was used to, it was like seventy percent better. Wow. And and compared to it to here. Oh, you mean where you're at now? Yeah, like oh, to where yeah. I am is well, like <laughs> I'm like in a mansion. Yeah, this is, but but that in itself, when you were in the care facility in Glendale, that hospice, that was way nicer living accommodations than you had experienced in a long, yeah, long time. Yeah, because then I had a bathroom that I didn't have to wait to get in. Mm. And, uh, you know, like, well, when I first got there, there were only three of us, an old man and an old lady that were like 90, and me. And then later they got other Scientology people, they start moving in. So when you got there, you were the only Sierra member initially. Yeah. So you did, were you distrustful of the people in the totally outside world? Yeah. So and I'm what is Scientology's term for? Wogs. Wogs. Yeah, I was totally afraid of everybody. And like I was so weak, they had to bring the potty chair by the bed for me to get out. I never did have to use diapers but I could get out and then go from my bed to the toilet. And they would, you know, change my do potty chair and everything and clean. <clears throat> so what did you do to pass the time when you were there? Oh, at first I would just lay there and look out the window. I was just freaked out. So you was, wouldn't watch TV or something? No, she asked me, she would ask me if I wanted to watch TV and I was afraid. Because there was a TV in that room, right? That was provided. A great big TV. Yeah, and, but... But had it been a while since she watched TV? I never, yeah, I had never watched TV since I've been in the Sea Org. So for 35 years you hadn't looked, you hadn't read the news. Would they provide you when you were in the Sea Org? Did they, what about the paper or no. magazines or anything like that? Any connection with the external world at no, all? No, you would get in trouble if you did, did that. Really? Yeah. So here you are, you're in a, a hospice facility. You kind of can do whatever you want in terms of entertainment. They have TV that you could watch. And you were scared to even watch the TV. I was afraid to watch TV. I had a, a window like this, and my bed was here, like in front of the window. Mm -hmm. And then people would walk up and down the sidewalk with their dogs or whatever. And I'd have the Venetian blind kind of so they couldn't see in, but I could see out. And, you know, and I'd watch the birds and stuff. And I, this was when I was in the room by myself and uh, I don't know I just started getting better then I you know start setting up and I'd sit by this side of my bed and eat then the physical therapy came and he started getting me up and I had I used this with a big long thing to because I couldn't be without oxygen I had yep. to be oxygen 24 7. Now so it's worth mentioning the 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 medical care that you were receiving, you had you, because you're low income, you qualified for both Medicare and Medi-Cal. Yeah. So all of this medical care in terms of physical therapy and all of this, these are things that were being ordered by the doctors from the hospital yeah. in order to now care for you as an individual that had state provided health insurance. Yeah. And such. They and, brought in one of these. Yeah, which is an oxygen generator. Yeah. And then they had the the um, the additional health. Uh, assistance through Medi-Cal, which is the same as the um, Medicaid mm -hmm. in other states, that you qualified for all of that. So the, the thing, was Scientology covering any of the medical bills other than the actual care facility that you were in, yeah. the hospice? So they had put you in hospice and they were paying for that, which is yeah. more than I expected them to do. But they weren't having to cover your medical bills. No. Or your medications. No. That was all things that were being covered by insurance. That's correct. Okay. Um, so once you started to relax into being in this hospice facility in Glendale, um, what did you start doing in order to pass the time? What, like, how did you end up like kind of getting yourself connected to the outside world and doing things other than staring out the window? And okay, so yeah, that lasted for about a month or so, and then uh, like some of my boxes and stuff were not even in London. They knew that they were going to move me to another room <coughs> where this other old lady was. So um, one day Barbell came by and she, you know, because I'm still sad, you know, 
wanting to go, thinking that I could go back to the medical house. And she says, no, you, you still have to stay here. But she said, I brought you this uh, thing called a Kindle, because she said it used to be um, David's, and he, you know, because he passed away. Her late husband? Yeah, her late husband. He passed away in December, the, just three months prior. So she wanted me to use it, so because it had like things to do jigsaw puzzles and mm -hmm. things like that, and uh, it had a Scientology icon that I could look so up. So all the Scientology, all the sci whatever Scientology app has. Yeah. Okay. So she wanted me to to use that and to start doing, you know, using that because I didn't want to watch the TV. To read the Scientology books that you're the extension course supervisor yeah. for for the last ten years. So Why she, wouldn't she want to? I know. She <laughs> you want to have to do everything over again. Oh, so she helped you get set up with an Amazon account? Yeah, with an Amazon account. Okay, so she got you an Amazon account so that you could then order yeah. order things that you might need off Amazon? I never did, Amazon. but she thought that I would. She was just trying to help me. So she got me a phone, too. Just just a, a cellular phone? A cellular phone. Okay. Because she had a ha I had to have a phone number. Which you also needed because you, most of your appointments for your doctor were telehealth, right? <clears throat> yeah. So she got you set up with a phone. So the MLO ended up setting you up with a phone and a Kindle. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. So what I could... Did, I was totally afraid of it. Yeah. <clears throat> I didn't even want it. So what did you she find didn't... that some of this... So you didn't want any of this at first. I didn't want... I was like, oh my God, I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about one of these flat things. It's confusing. You know... It was like freaked out, and uh, so, you know, this way, like, a lot of times I would call the doctor, it would just be the doctor's, for COVID you couldn't go out, so you have a doctor's appointment over the phone, and this was better for her, because she's got a thousand people, right. and they're just trying to get me out of their hair, but what they were doing was giving me a means of com communicating with the outside world. Yeah. And I crept up on it. Um, she showed me how to get into YouTube, I forget how, to look up music. But then I start, I thought, oh, I'm going to look up L. Ron Hubbard. All of the amazing works and everything that's yeah, been being told and, you and about. Yeah, and I'm going to watch that. Expansion. And I'm looking up this stuff and finding all this horrible things that people are saying about L. Ron Hubbard. And I'm seeing him on YouTube, and he looks like a crazy idiot. So the things that you were finding on YouTube um, was so uh, these totally are contrary to everything to, that you were hearing in Scientology. To what I always believed for 35 years that they're having to say and how great he is and everything. But so then we started communicating with one another a bit at a time, right? Right. And um, and as we were communicating, I didn't start in with all of the anti-Scientology. I don't believe in what you believe and all this because quite, I just wanted you to be happy. I wasn't trying to go you in and smash your world. You never came in like that at all. I, I wanted you to believe what your own truth. I wanted you to live that. I wanted you to, of course, I wanted you in, in our life, but at the same time, I wasn't trying to go in there and tell you you're wrong. Yeah. But That's you great. started telling me a lot of stories. And you know, as what we were I, talking, what did I say? Well, just different things like about your experiences while you were in the Sea Org, and like I had questions about, hey, what were you talking about with this financial stuff? Like, as there are yeah. all, this, all these different schemes, and we can go into them in a bit to get all this money out of you. Right. Uh, and as you're telling me about this, I'm like, Mom, don't you think that that's not right? Like, don't you think that this is criminal behavior? Don't you think that this is extortion? Don't you think this is like them taking advantage of you? And you did. You're like, yeah, I do, and I hate it. I know. It was sort of, you know what was sort of funny? I remember reading Mike Render's book. Like, it took him five years prior to running away, where he would always be thinking, like, I don't like this. And it was the same way with me. In, like, 2014, or maybe before that, I was already thinking, these guys are a bunch of crooks. Right. And then they would just go from one thing to the next. Yeah. And I didn't know how I was going to... You felt stuck. I was t totally trapped. 
So I remember I was like, hey, I would like you to watch a documentary if you want to. There's this documentary. Uh, it was uh, based off a book by uh, Lawrence Wright. It's called Going Clear, Scientology and the Prison of Belief. I, I told you, I watched this. It's, it brings, <coughs> you're going you're gonna to see a lot of people in this documentary that you know, that you uh, probably consider friends, and they, and I just want you to watch it. If at the end of watching it, you disagree with it and never want to see it again, fine. We'll never, I'll never bring it up again. I just want you to watch it. That's all I want you to do. Right. So, you watched Going Clear, Scientology, and the Prison of Belief. What did you think? God. After I watched it, I thought, that's it. I'm done. Done with what? What do you mean? I'm done with Scientology. Just like that? Yeah. 38 years and you're just like, well, so what was your, what was your reaction? What did you physically do when you I were there? I couldn't, well. Tell me about it. It was like, I felt like I was totally manipulated, lied to, um, conned into, uh, I don't even know how to, like, made a fool of. Mm -hmm. I wasted my whole life. It was just horrible. Betrayed, maybe? Betrayed, absolutely. <laughs> so so you, you probably had a lot of Scientology memorabilia and necklaces and shirts and stuff like that. I remember you told oh, me, yeah. what did you do with those things? Anyway, I had all, you know, I had... You're doing a little better at this point physically. You're kind of up and about. Yeah, by, by this time... This whole, like, feeding you and letting you sleep and keeping you on oxygen is, is apparently good for you. Yeah. And you're, like, doing things like walking and breathing again. Like, yeah, I'm going outside and walking with my walker by myself and stuff like that. So now that you're able to get up and about, now that you're able to get out of, you know, bed and all this, and then you watch this video, what did you, what was your reaction with oh, your my, Scientology possessions? Yeah, with my Scientology possessions, what I did was, because I had necklaces, you know, like the, you know, the IS pins for the different, because I had, I paid $22,000 for the Crusader pin. <coughs> so expensive pin. <coughs> anyway, what I did is I, I threw all that stuff away, like just threw it in the trash. Uh, any t-shirts that I had that, you know, the ideal org t-shirts and all that, I cut them up and then used them to clean the floor with, I put them under my feet and, and just dusted the floor off, like sprayed water. <laughs> anyway, I hated them. I I threw all that stuff in the trash. Wow. I don't have anything. And the only thing I had at the last was I had a Sea Org robe that had a the emblem of the Sea Org, you know, Sea Org crest or the crest the there symbol. on it. Because yeah. we got those for, and it was like a towel, you know, that you put on after you got out of the shower and then you could go back to your bed and then dry off. Because everybody, it's like a, that was like an assembly line. Assembly right line, so you just put on this. <clears throat> so they gave it to you as a bit of a necessity, not yeah, as like a Yeah, it was a, like a, a Christmas present. <laughs> anyway, I had that on the last, I got my last shower on Tuesday, which was like the 29th of March or something. Yeah. And so I rolled it up and put it in the garbage and I gave well, it that's, to them. That's when I... Uh, I told them to throw it in the trash. That's when I, later when we, when we got you out of there? Yeah, that was the day before I left. <laughs> So but that was the last thing I had that had anything with Sea Org emblem or anything on it. I don't want nothing in my possession the, um, uh, that reminded me of them. Anyway, I, so, and I remember that day I went outside and walked up the driveway and I was looking in the sunlight and I thought, I am free of this. I finally broke my mantle confounds in my head that I that kept me I was like stuck into it yeah like I couldn't break from knowing that the organization was criminal but I was believing in L. Ron Hubbard but at that point I didn't believe in L. Ron Hubbard either he was a total nut yeah <clears throat> so I, I it was like I finally broke the shackles that were because before it was just 
I kept going on and on thinking, if I can just get to the bridge, I could go clear. Yeah. You know, with L. Ron Hubbard's tech, because they're keeping me from it. So you, you, you believed that the organization, that as being run by David Miscavige, had become corrupt and criminal. Yes. That you were working in, but you still believed in Hubbard. Yes. Like, I was not <clears throat> believing in the organization for years. Like, right. I kept thinking they were so corrupt, but I thought, I'm paying for this. they got to give it to me. Yeah. If I could just get it, that's what I want so that I could go clear, because we're the only ones that that are going to be able to survive this universe, with, you know, yeah. all of his shit that he... Right. And then I realized that he was just full of crap and nothing but a con artist. Yeah, I was like crying, standing out there crying under the tree by myself, holding on to my walker, looking out to the mountains. And I just thought, oh my God, how am I going to get out of here? Now I'm... I felt totally um, separated from where the people that I was supposed to be taking care of me. How am I supposed to act now? So how did you act? And because I, it, it was a while for us to figure out how to get you out of there because we didn't even know you were physically able to, nor did we even have any the legal means. the means or legal connection to each other to be able to help you out. So did you tell... Adrian and Barbell, too, that you were sick of being a seer member no, of Scientology? No, I just kept it all a secret. It's like undercover behind en enemy lines. I was like a spy inside the enemy camp getting information. Yeah, we did do a little data for, collection before you left. Yeah, it was in October last year. Right. That's when Rowan helped us. Yeah, so the you first thing the was, the first thing is we had to get will power of attorney. Uh, we needed to get a medical, uh, advanced medical directive. We had to get everything in place so that I could help you with your finances um, so that we could get it so that Scientology wasn't physically, because they had, you know, like they were your medical power of attorney. Yeah. They, they really and I owned, had signed off to them. Right. This, so they really owned you. So I knew that we needed to get those legal papers in place so that I could advocate for you. Exactly. Um, which I drafted everything up and I was able to send them to a friend, Roanne, who, you know, you knew very well. And uh, I grew up with Roanne, so she was very willing to help. She brought them over to you. Um, you were able to sign them. We got everything notarized. She picked them up. We got it sent back. And you also create. You also wrote something that I'm. I'm just going to read real fast, which was a letter, a letter to the authorities in the event that you went missing. Yes. Um, and it says, "This is in October 6, 2021." Right. To the authorities, I, Rosemary Chickwalk, being of sound mind and on my own behalf, am writing this letter in the event I am unable to be contacted or located by ne my next of kin and son, Michael R. Brown. In the past 35 years, I have been in the employment of various organizations that work for and within the Church of Scientology. During this time, I was required to sever ties with my son due to his non-involvement with their beliefs. I currently reside in a care facility in Glendale, California, paid for by the Scientology organization for which I work. While I'm here, I have been able to act on my own volition and have reconnected with Michael. I fear that if the organization discovers that I am communicating with my son, they will take efforts to physically relocate me and hinder my communication with my family and loved ones. If my son and next to Ken, Michael R. Brown, is presenting this letter to you, he has been unable to verify my well-being, and I should be considered missing and being held against my will. Sincerely, Rosemary Chickwalk. And then there is a, uh, it has been notarized and signed. Exactly. Um, and so signed by you and actually the notary public literally put their notary stamp on this and there's a notary paper with it. Yeah. That's a big statement <clears throat> um, that's for somebody correct. that's been a CERC member for 35 years to basically say, hey, if they, if they touch me, I'm being kidnapped. Yeah. But you thought that that could potentially happen if they found out that we were talking and you were wanting to leave, right? Absolutely, it could have happened. It could... I see that me reading that, you, you got a little emotional about it. Yeah, it was like... I did. Um, anyway, like they could have moved me, so I thought I can't mess this up. Somehow, I had the, I made up my mind I was going to get out of there, 
at that point. Right. And because um, I just thought I had the I had the liberty somehow in that house. I did this just by necessity level. You've taught yourself how to do quite a bit with technology in a very short period of time. I can't believe it. So we had to get all your legal stuff taken care of. We had to verify medically with the doctors in such oh, a way yeah. to find out that you were okay to travel. That we had to get you the oxygen stuff set up, and we had to figure out what to do because for somebody to blow is hard, but for an elderly person that has severe medical needs is a totally separate thing. We had to make sure that the doctors were able to help us and figure all these specifics out, get all the paperwork we needed to be able to move you to a facility here and everything they needed to get you integrated and all of that paperwork and medical stuff when none of the things existed. So it took us quite a few months to get it all done. Yeah, and like getting the doctors, the cardio doctor, to say it's okay for me to fly. That was the biggest thing. That was like the biggest thing. I don't think you could have tolerated a drive cross country. Because just in December, I had just had COVID and was in the hospital. Right. So then the first of this, <clears throat> this year, the first of this year it's just been, yeah. um, we got approval from Dr. Lee. He put a patch on me, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, did a bunch of testing. Did a whole bunch of testing just because... He was wanting to. It was just coincidental, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> and he was just kind of worried that maybe I was coming up with something. But nothing came up on the test. He gave me approval that I was sort of stable. And you could air travel. And that I could air travel. As long as you had oxygen. Yeah. I think that was like in February, <clears throat> finally, when we got all the tests back from the January patch and yak, 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 whatever we were doing. Mm hmm and I was just kind of going with it. Well, yeah, you, you came it. like on Sunday, and you sent me a picture of yourself, a selfie of you at the airport, and I'm like sitting at my little card table looking out the window, seeing you, you know, and I'm like all the stuff that I'm receiving, I'm just, you know, receiving it myself. I don't have anybody to communicate to or anything, and I'm just like, oh my God, you know. So the, there he is, he's here, you know, and then you would tell me what you were doing each day. So finally it's the, the morning of the escape, right? And I thought, oh, I can't oversleep. There was no way I was going to oversleep. I was up like most of the night. And um, anyway, so I got up and I remember telling the the aide that was working there, you know, that I had um, family that was coming yeah. and they were going to come at eight o'clock to take me to the bank. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I had to have breakfast by seven, you know, otherwise she would, the routine was not that way. Yeah. She had me breakfast at eight and da -da. anyway. So all my little things that I had set up by telling them lying to them about how everything was going. All was going per perfect. Anyway, so then that morning, you, you said it was that, you know, you were coming, you sent me a text, said that you were there and that you guys were coming towards the door to come in. And I couldn't believe it. And then I, she went, opens the door. I could remember seeing you guys just coming in, like you kind of sort of like barged in. You we were very pleasant. Yeah, you were pleasant. Nah. And then I'm in my bedroom, right? I think I opened the door. Anyway, when I saw you, I, um, emotionally, I could, I started shaking. I couldn't believe it. Um, I couldn't keep my body from doing that. It was like I couldn't believe this was happening. Thanks. It was like such a good emotion. Like, um, oh my God, I got this sort of like, um, I don't know how you feel it, like, you know, like you were stranded or like, for example, like you're maybe left behind on a desert island and somebody came and finally found you. Yeah. Like you're finally like safe. Right. Like after you had been um, 
like out in the weird wilderness for so long and you didn't know how you were ever going to get out of that? My goal was to be in and out of there in uh, 15 minutes. I think it took us 17. We had all your <laughs> stuff packed. I had, we'd measured out everything and how exactly how big it was. We had all of the stuff to put it in trunks. We had you packed up and ready to go. We got your medication from the caregiver. Let them know, hey, she's moving. Like you did it so fast, I was like... Uh, you know, emotional for a little while, and before I knew it, we were leaving, still uh, trying to, you know, contain my tears and everything, and you guys are just like going at it, and picked up, did, did everything, and uh, whisked me out the door, type, so to speak. Yeah, we, we wanted to make it fast because I was concerned, so I, we had timed out everything and how long it would take for somebody to drive from pack, and the, the approximate travel time is between uh, 15 to 17 minutes when there's no traffic and as much as 25 when there is traffic. So it was just at 8 o'clock in the morning, so it was kind of rush hour. So I, I, I assumed that it would take them longer to respond than it would be for us to get you out. Yeah. And then we also, it was important to us to not alert anyone that you were leaving until we were actually doing so. So but from the time we actually told the caregiver that, we were, that you were leaving, um, to us actually being gone was about three minutes. Um, and then you, the, the person who's the guy that runs that facility or owns that house was a, that Armenian guy named Romic. Yeah, Romic. So you then sent him a text when we left that said, Romic, I'm, I'm leaving. Thank you for everything. I'm, I'm moving back to be closer to my family back east. You know, uh, thanks for everything. Have a nice day. I'm completely fine. What was his response to you? So then he responded back saying, I don't know who this is sending this text. But you need to get back here within a half hour or I'm calling the cops. Which is... I don't know what he you're, said. You're, you weren't a patient there, so that's actually just threatening you. Yeah. And is illegal because you weren't, you're not an inpatient in that. You're literally a guest. You're, you're a paid person that's staying there. You're free yeah. to go whenever you want. That's just a very strange thing. So we were already in contact with the FBI and they told us that, you know, don't worry about it. You're good to go. Um, did he call the cops? If he did, they must have just said, forget it. So who did he contact? I don't know. I, he contacted Barbell and Adrian. Okay. Which we find out about kind of after the fact, because then she leaves a message on your, hey, I heard you're moving back with family. That's fine. Or you left yeah. a message and said you went back with family. I never left her any message. Yeah. She and was just she fishing calls, around for where you were. She's just trying to fish around for where I, Barbell never did answer any call. It was Adrian, but Adrian is Barbell's senior. Right. So she's like, you know, now she's like worried, like where, how I got out of there. Yeah. So. Anyway. We got you out of there. Um, we got you back They're here. They're always li lying, usually, about what they say. Mm -hmm. So since you've arrived back here, um, how does it feel to be away from Scientology in the oh. sewer? This has been so wonderful. Like, in April, it was a, like the most beautiful month. Everything was, it was like springtime, blossoms on the trees. I, I was taking pictures every time I'd go outside of how beautiful it was. <coughs> and this, the building is just a great big building with, it's got an upstairs and downstairs and it's, I just call it my big mansion, but it's sort of like, <laughs> it's... Um, we have a lot of other people here that you can interact with, too. Yeah, right? I like have a lot of friends, and we have... What I like the most every week is I have a little art class that a bunch of us old ladies get together and do, and, and the uh, person that runs it, she uh, always has us have a do a little project, yeah. and each of us do something similar, but we kind of create our own thing. Yeah. And um, I just have friends you know that i talk to when we take walks together and right. sit on the porch together and talk and so you're happy here and i'm very happy here <laughs>
<clears throat> I believe that these are the type of stories we have to be bringing forward. Uh, we, we do have some um, questions that I'll get to in a minute. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll work through that. And as long as you can tolerate me and the sound of my voice sitting here yammering on about this, we'll go through this stuff and I'll, I'll take as much time as you guys want. Uh, it's kind of hard for me to go back and forth between, I try to star things uh, during her videos so that we can kind of address those, which is the main purpose of me doing this tonight. Um, so during that, like I said, if you had questions, you know, marking it with question at this point, I'm probably going to focus on the starred stuff. And I'm on, and as the chat keeps going, it's hard for me to keep up with it. I don't, I don't have somebody in the background starring questions for me, uh, although the mods are doing a great job doing traffic control and, you know, providing uh, Kathy Ann, providing uh, some, you know, links and stuff and information. I'm so, so happy for that. Thank you so much. Um, if you do want to throw in something right now, if um, it would probably be, uh, wow, thank you so much. Uh, some amazing super chats and stuff coming in. I'm going into the, uh, the start stuff to go through those a little bit. Once I go through some of these at the end, I will kind of say something about my friend Miriam, um, just because I'm not going to ignore that. I just wanted to get to the point of uh, the video I intended to do, but I'm not going to ignore and be tone deaf uh, to the um, the changes that are in the wind uh, with things. And I'll, I'll at least uh, weigh in a little bit without uh, getting involved too terribly much. If you want to throw something in at this point, um, if you can put it in as a super chat, it'll go straight in. I'll try to check back and forth, but um, but I, I'll probably do a, a substandard job of doing it. So uh, let me, some of these um, mom might have answered it going through it, but I'll try to elaborate where it makes sense. But if she covered it, I'll just kind of uh, do a fast recapping on it. So bear with me. We'll figure this out. And let me go ahead and start this uh, from winter question. Mike, have Laura and the other uh, feed videos of uh, oh the, the elderly for your mom to identify? Um, I know mom watches a lot of uh, content and I know that she watches a lot of Laura content. Her and Laura are actually quite good friends. They chat. Uh, on the sly on the side and even uh, we'll probably do a little video of this uh, just talking about Laura and her family with mom uh, so that Laura and I can do it together. I don't know if she's tried to identify the people in the videos. We could try to do that. I just have to pull them up and get the timestamps on when to do that. Um, I just haven't had a chance. This is kind of a juggling act for me doing this and then uh, trying to do all the other stuff um, in the rest of my life. But that's a good idea. When she did come out, uh, when she was kind of behind enemy lines, as she said, um, there was some months that it took us to get everything together. And during that time, she was just doing data collection for me. Who else is there? What locations are there? And I have a ton of this information, all of which has been given to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who has interviewed her up for hours and hours and gotten all of her information. We have not failed to share. So um, we will continue to keep trying to identify. I do think that trying to help people identify their loved ones when they end there is uh, very important. So uh, that's a great idea. Thank you very much. All right, let's get on to the next one here. Ted asked question. Okay, so Rosemary must have known that some of the outside world was not uh, to be uh, that way. Otherwise there wouldn't be doubt. Um, this would be tough. What percentage of the outside world was scary? Um, that's a good question. So the, and this is kind of the weird dichotomy of Scientology and the Sea Organization. There's supposed to be this external facing thing to clear the planet and bring Scientology to everybody. Yet all of their staff have their information flow and their behavior and all of their thoughts so tightly controlled that it's this weird thing between, um, like fear of everything and actually being able to, uh, interact. So it's all very, um, commercial and fake. So they, they're sort of like shelter animals and I don't want to degrade the people that are in there, but if you don't let a, like, if you don't interact with your environment, you're not sure what to do with your environment. So the more like they're being told how Scientology is expanding and everything that they're doing is wonderful, yet they're not able to walk outside of that complex area. And it used to be, you had to go with a buddy and then they changed it to, you had to go with a group of three, which is very interesting. That's something that the Soviet military required for all of its the designing of its vehicles, some of their helicopters and things, you had to have three people to run them and they would all be from different backgrounds. So it's harder to de defect or escape. And Scientology started doing that too. And now they've gotten to the point of just not letting them out at all. So, uh, and, and so there was a lot of fear built into it, but with this strange thing that what you're doing is saving all of the people in that outside world. So very, very odd. Thank you very much for the question. I appreciate it. All right, escaping the cultiverse question, was Rosemary questioning any part of Scientology at this time? 
So as she kind of explained, in her mind, L. Ron Hubbard was still somebody that she believed in, his technology. That was all something that she thought that she was going to try to hit these different benchmarks as she was moving up in these spiritual enlightenment levels. And she had no idea um, that, she, that there was nothing to that. So even though she knew that the organization was criminal and she didn't like a lot of the things that were going on, she thought that she could wait it out and it would get better. Unfortunately, it never did. So that was, I think, is probably the state of mind of a lot of people in there. So when these protesters are around sowing seeds of doubt, like, what do you think about David Miscavige changing it all up every single time and all these things that are happening and Scientology declining? When you're putting like these little uh, tidbits of information, these little kernels of truth in there, it's going to slowly start to accumulate, even though they push it out to the edges. I think any interaction is good interaction. And most of what I've seen about the protests have been respectful. Um, and just trying to communicate with people of which you'll see that they're unable to have a nuanced conversation and a detailed discussion about anything. They just run off or, you know, round their people up and move them inside as fast as possible. It's so strange. Um, thank you very much. Oh, this is something my wife gave me some, um, critique on last time. Apparently every time I answer a question at the end of it, I end it with thank you very much. And uh, she told me all about it last time. So apparently I'm trying to be like fat Elvis or something. So I appreciate it, Emily. Thanks for pointing it out to me. Um, please remind <laughs> John Sasowski, please remind us what her age is now. Uh, she's about 77. Uh, she had me when she was uh, 30 years old. So everyone can do the math on that and tell you how much of a spring chicken I am. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Just throw it in my face, bud. No big deal. <laughs> All right. uh, moving on. Uh, dark sarcasm question. Were you afraid that there would have been retaliation from Church of Scientology because you were sick, could not work, or have uh, many encounters um, with then WOGS, that, their term for non-Scientologist raw meat people? Um, and she did use that term in there, but it was because I prompted her to just to, I'm trying to get the interactions of what it was like for these people as they come out. She does know that that is a slur now. She did not when she first came out in some countries that's very disrespectful. Um, but, you know, just, you know, just to kind of note that point. So she was concerned when she was there. She talked about when she needed to get out, like, what are they going to do? Once I got her out of this and we started kind of contacting authorities, we have had some problems with private investigators coming around. One tried to infiltrate her care facility on two occasions, once trying to pretend he was law enforcement and another time trying to pretend he was getting somebody else in that same care facility. And the staff were already prepped and they kicked him out and called the cops. And then he was sniffing around my house. I took a bunch of pictures of him. We had Aaron help me smash him on uh, YouTube and uh, we gave him a bunch of bad Google reviews. So he hasn't been back since, but we still get a little bit of uh, messing around with us. But at this point, there's so much going on that I think it, it, that everyone's realized like, hey, we need to do something about it. And if Rosemary is strong enough and willing enough to do this at you know her age, it's never too late for somebody to speak up. So by all means, please do so. Thank you very much. All right, moving along. Um, uh, re Marie, uh, Marianne question. Uh, hey, Mike, do you know if Rosemary has been watching these protests? If so, what does she think about them? I wonder if she had escaped in the younger days, would she have been at the protest? That's a good question because I mean, we joined all of this when she was in her forties, but I'm, I don't know, maybe she would be. She's such, um, my mom's a great person and she's so kind and loving that it's, uh, uh it's hard to tell if she would have, but I'll ask her that question at some point. I think it'd be pretty funny to uh, get her reaction. Um, she has been watching them. She watched all the stuff that happened with Aaron. She does think that what is important is keeping people from going in. I mean, if you think about it, any, any operation, even if, you know, I always look at things just through the lens of my profession, but there's more than one facet to any one operation as people do things to try to focus on the people that are inside, keeping people from going inside and getting recruited is also meaningful and important. And I think that she kind of, you know, understands that. I'll tell you that the protests are very ineffective for the people that are inside. But I do think it's important for those public that are going in there, if they're having you know these questions asked to them, because those are not the Sea Org members. A lot of the people that are walking around and being interfaced with outside, all the Sea Org members are being locked up in there. But having those paying public ask questions about Danny Masterson on what's going on, having them interact, you can see that that's the people the security guards come and grab. So absolutely, those people should be interacted with. And these are peaceful protests. So, you know, that's, there's nothing bad about that. But um, 
very little Sea Org members are going to get out because of it, although it, it's going to keep them inside more. And at some point, people are going to be like, this is crap. I'm out of here. So maybe some people will pop out the edges and leave. We'll see. All right. Uh, Casey, yes, uh, security measures. Uh, Kindle seems to be a security risk because it opens up the world for information. Um, the fact she was given a Kindle, I am sure the fact that we've shared that now, that medical liaison officer Barbell, I guarantee she has gotten into a world of trouble that they are not allowed. The, those are completely forbidden because of that reason. You're not allowed to have cell phones. Um, in Jenna's book, um, Jenna Miscavige, uh, Beyond Belief, she talked about how they were rounding up cell phones from everybody and she didn't want to give them up. It has gotten more and more and more strict on that just to keep people from having external influences. So yeah, they uh, that was a big problem. As you can see, like this is a, a lady in her late 70s taught herself to use the internet and deprogrammed herself. So Kendall's technology, they don't want that. That's a bad thing for them. Bruce, how could anyone treat the sweet lady that way? You got, you got me, Bruce. Like, uh, are you kidding me? They, this is, this is what David Miscavige is wasting every single day. He has a workforce that is willing to work for next to nothing because of something they believe in. If he just let people talk to their families, let people leave if they wanted to stopped all of the like objectionable things about Scientology, the way that it treats its old people, the way that it treats its young people, the fact that it steals money from people, the fact that it does no community good. If he focused on changing those things and it's like, hey, we can open this up. It's not the crazy of Scientology that does this. It's the way that the people are treated and the crimes that makes people so um, viscerally upset about them. And that's where I'm at about it. I, I know it's a rhetorical question, but it's worth expounding on. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Lacey Silver question. Does Rosemary, how does Rosemary feel now that she's out? I think she answered that fairly well towards the end. Um, she's pretty happy and I am very happy to have her out. And so are her grandchildren, uh, so are her grandchildren, my kids and, uh, grandma Rose is now a part of our life. So I'm pretty happy about it. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see question here. Sorry, I'm not faster at this guys. I'll get better as I do them. This is like my second one. So I appreciate everyone that's sticking around with me question. Can you make an Amazon wish list for Rosemary? Um, yeah, as she needs stuff, um, we've, she's gone. It's, it's very strange. She's gone from having absolutely nothing to being very well, um, provided for, and she has everything that she wants. And, uh, we've kind of made sure that that happened kind of upfront. Um, but as things come up, um, I, you know, the contributions that you guys give us super chats, um, the, you know, I know the moderator put in there for people that do want to contribute. We uh, set up a PayPal account. It's going to go into this little, you know, kind of organization that I set up that's going to, uh, you know, keep her um, story coming out. And that's what I've tried to set this up as. So that is a way we set up for contributions on that. Uh, if it, comes up with an Amazon wish list of stuff. Um, that's a good idea. I just don't know if I have a, uh, like a, a bunch of stuff that I could get her that wouldn't just inundate her with things. And as strange as this sounds too many things after you've had nothing for so, so long actually makes, it makes her feel overwhelmed and a bit nervous. So the things that she has, the, the kind words that everyone is saying, the contributions in that way, uh, probably mean more than you're giving yourselves credit for. So um, thanks. Um, and, and I appreciate you very much for asking. I appreciate it a lot. All right, Mandy, me question. How long did it take to get the paperwork together? Weeks, months? Uh, it was months and it was a lot of little different pieces. So it was all of the things from the doctors. Can we move her all the legal papers? Once we get everything figured out, where are we going to move her to? And I know that there's a lot of controversy right now with the aftermath foundation. The, I do want to, I, I do want to give credit where credit was due. Um, that, that entire organization, which this is pre all of the shenanigans that occurred late last year with, you know, the differences in the board members and all this stuff, when it was set up and working the way that it was supposed to. And um, what what the, the help that we got from all of those board members to include Aaron Smith Levin and uh, the Headleys and Renders and all of them, it was great. And um, they they put us in a position to be able to focus on the details. And then they were helping with um, the monetary 
uh, things that we needed in logistics. And Claire Headley was instrumental in that. So I'm going to give her kudos where that, where, where it's due on that and um, whatever's going on. I want to just make sure that we focus specifically on this was something that was very much a benefit to my family where the Aftermath Foundation and all of those people involved helped us greatly. So it was a big process to get it all together. It took us probably six months of all the planning before we could execute it. Meanwhile, she's like behind enemy lines and uh, I was trying my fastest to figure it out. So anyway, now we're here and we can talk about it. So good times. All right. Uh, I am Gabriel. Um, question, has uh, Adult Protective Services gotten involved in any way with helping the remaining members? So we have filed, we have provided all of the information of who she knew that was there in these various locations and whatever she knew about their financial situation and their health situation to the authorities. Um, with Adult Protective Services, it's very hard to call without making a specific um, statement as a family member or somebody that has a connection to a person. So anyone that I know, and as they have information and questions, um, I've been able to kind of feed those out to other people. So it's like, hey, this is at least what my mom knows about your your parents or whatever it is so that they can act on those things. So we've tried to at least collect a list up and then provide it to law enforcement. And, and as um, opportunities to do something about it arise, we're trying to focus on that. So it's not like we're stopping at this point. As I have a bright idea, hey, let's try this. Um, but the adult, the adult protective services, I tried to call them about my mom and they're like, wait, she's not there now. And I'm like, well, no. And they're like, we can't really help you. Like you need to call us about somebody here right now and that you're connected to. And I'm like, okay, thanks. So I hope that answered the question, but it's a good point because I had the same question and I was trying to figure it out and it wasn't, uh, it didn't make sense to me at first. All right. Let's see. Uh, Ken Daliex. I'm probably butchering that. I apologize. How many more with Rosemary were still uh, trapped, afraid to speak, or went out? Uh, makes my stomach ache for those uh, without an advocate. I, I agree. So the list that we um, put together was about 30 other people just in the area where she was working that she knew there were citizen, uh, senior citizens in the same location. And this was put together um, within like the last you know, uh, 16 months to 24 months in terms of the recency of it. And um, so there's been a lot of things that have changed since then. Now realize every single year, somebody is crossing that threshold of 65 years old in the C organization. They're starting to get social security. And as income is coming in, if they do what they were doing to my mom, they're going to start taking that money from them and putting it into the organization slush fund. So hopefully me complaining about this makes it so they don't with those people. And those people then have their social security starting to kind of add add up and, you know, get a hefty little nest egg of a bank account. And maybe they at some point say, I want out and I'm going to, you know, get myself out of here. That's what I would hope for. So they don't just keep taking that money from them. So activism work, me here complaining on YouTube, hopefully it makes a difference on some of that stuff. So, but quite a few. Um, and that was just in the one little crappy location that I showed you at the beginning of this video where everything was not all of the other Sea Org bases. So there's, there's more stuff. Thanks. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, Deanna Ross, question to the aftermath intend for this video to be published like the Sergio Belinsky uh, video. They, uh, uh, the, the easy answer is yes, they wanted this to be a uh, aftermath documentary video. At one point, we were kind of working together on that. After all of the other things that have gone on, I've kind of backed away from that just because I don't want my mother's story to be mixed up in all of the other politics and problems going on. So like I said, I appreciate very much the help that was given. I'll forever be in the debt of the people that helped us. Um, but at the same time, I believe this is the story that is my my mom's story and my story to bring to the world. And I don't really want somebody else representing it um, and in control of it when I think that I should just do it myself. So here I am. And the documentary is going to have my crappy sound and us working through it. But what you're going to get is the authenticity of my mother. And then I'll try to supplement as best I can. And I promise you, I'll get better at this as I go along. But this is your documentary. <laughs> maybe maybe at some point we'll put this uh, together and it'll be something else. But for now, I think that this is at least getting the word out. So here we go. Wow. Um, and I am uh, very thankful for our supplies for Rosemary and her fellow artists. I will put it to exactly that. Thank you so much. Um, she loves some art. I will make a point the next time I do one of these videos for mom, I'm going to bring some of her art and show them. Um, I'll get some uh, stuff and I'll put them up and I'll do a little art show at the end when, uh, there's not all this other stuff going on that I want to talk about at the end. Um, that is an excellent idea. And, uh, I'm, I'm humbled by your, um, generous donation. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Um, R to A, uh, join the chat late. Uh, what does Rosemary like to do? Uh, she likes to sometimes just do nothing, but she's used to doing a lot. So she loves to draw. She loves to write poetry. I'll have to give bring some selections of that. Maybe I'll uh, have her do a reading or something at the beginning every once in a while. I think that that would be a lot of fun. Um, she loves her poetry. She loves her art. She We have a bird feeder set up outside of her window, and she loves to like keep track of the birds and all that. She loves her grand, uh, grandkids. She loves a lot of SPTV, and sometimes I tell her, Mom, don't watch some of this stuff after dinner if you're trying to relax and go to sleep. But she consumes all that. She likes the game show channels. Um, she likes watching The View in the morning, catching up on the world, like doing doing pop culture stuff feels uh, like probably really fun and naughty for her. So, hey, get after it. Go, Mom. Um, all right. And let's see. And then I have one more uh, super chat. There might have been some other questions that came through. Uh, for everybody, I'm sorry about that, but uh, does it matter um, you to um, you not to me? Does it matter to you not to me? Uh, you're a hero in many ways. Respect. Uh, what would you ask? Can SBTV standpoint, please? Osa um, want to break it up? That's their purpose. Okay. Um, some thoughts on this. There is uh, right now some infighting, some differences in opinion. You're always going to have that with people, and I, and I agree with you. the The focus on the work is very, very important. But um, we were never allowed to have disagreements and you would never be allowed to have varying opinions in Scientology. It's not allowed. Whatever says goes and the organization controls your behavior with respect to what you're supposed to do. And it has to go in this one direction and on these lines. And you can never have nuanced discussion or disagreements. And I think one of the things that is very unique about humans is uh, we're all about some disagreements, um, 100% you will um, see that the disagreements are always going to be occurring either, you know, on different people with different opinions and different approaches to stuff. And I think everyone lending their voice is very, very important. And that's what they should do. Um, so you're never going to get rid of that. I do think as we go forward, and I'm going to kind of transition a little bit to talking about some of the stuff that came up over the last couple of days and some um, kind of nasty letters that were sent um, to my friend Miriam and also one of the journalists that's trying to help her um, down the rabbit hole. I think Alex the Rabbit is uh, going to be uh, representing Miriam in a discussion. Um, some of that stuff is, um, it's not okay. And, and there's a certain point where you have disagreements and there's just, you know, basic differences on how things work. And then you have just things that are just a complete and total, total distraction. As things go forward, and Miriam is sharing her story. This is even if there's some, if Mike ends up getting some shrapnel, and I hope Mike's fine. I hope everyone can sing Kumbaya at some point and everything's better. But unfortunately, that's probably not going to happen. Just know that any of the complaints that people are complaining about, if you look at the root of it, it makes Scientology look like crap no matter what. So the, th the discussions that are being talked about, even if someone's kind of getting drawn into it, you're talking about crimes that have to do with Scientology. Scientology is at the base root of all this. The actual rot occurs from Scientology and moves upward and outward. The way people are actually dealing with that is kind of their business and they need to do so in a responsible manner. I do not want to talk about or go into details about what Miriam is going to talk about with uh, on the uh, down the rabbit hole. Uh, discussion with Rabbit. And I think that she just refers to herself as Rabbit. Um, I'm going to let her go into the details of that. She and I have been working closely together. If any of you are um, looking at other videos on my channel, you can see that Miriam recently helped me share and come out about all the details of my childhood story, which was pretty nasty. And you can see some of the videos that are on the channel. There's a, like a three-parter that I did with her and Christy Gordon. They got me talking about stuff I haven't shared except for with some very, very close friends. And um, you'll find out a little bit more about me. Um, Miriam, because we were working closely together, Miriam and, um, and I started a dialogue and we had been in contact just working together. And this was well before all this stuff kicked off around uh, November of last year with the Aftermath Foundation, that we had recorded all these episodes for my thing well in advance. And then they like to produce them into a little bit more of an edited thing as opposed to just me ad-libbing it here on, 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 on a live. So when Miriam and I were working together on this, 
certain stuff started coming out where she's trying to work with Mike Rinder in order to get some stuff that she needs. She started running into some problems and I'm not going to get into the details about what those were. She then started to confide in me about what those problems were. I tried to help her like navigate that. And at a certain point, it got to the point where she was not able to get the results that she was hoping for from both Mike Rinder. And also she was trying to work with the Aftermath Foundation. She was kind of being shut out by them. As some of you have indicated, you know, I, I had a, a, a relationship with the Aftermath Foundation. They helped me get my mother out of there financially. They were the provider of a lot of goodwill that was provided by donors. They are the, they were, they're the custodians of goodwill in a way that's supposed to be then shared with people that need it. And that is a good m mission that has to exist. So I had a dialogue and Claire was part of my like speed dial, like uh, in, in that way. Um, after all the stuff, after Thanksgiving, everything got weird and with all these relationships between these different creators. I work with Aaron, I worked with Claire and everything has been getting awkward. I'm just going to be honest about that. But when I'm working with Miriam, somebody that I very much respect, this person should be a shell of a person. And she is to, she is a, a formidable woman. She does not put up with anything. And if I had been through the amount of trauma she's been through, I wouldn't be like nearly as functional as I am today. I respect her very, very much. When she was sharing all this with me, I tried to help her bring this to the Aftermath Foundation president, Claire, like, hey, something's going on. I'd like you guys to address this. This was on the 21st. Uh, about 10 days ago. Um, and I sent an email. And um, as a result, they've stopped emailing me. Um, I tried to provide a dialogue and an opportunity for both Miriam and Claire to talk and then also hopefully, you know, have work through whatever's going on with Mike Render. And I feel like that effort failed. Um, the only reason I'm bringing that up is I don't want people to see Miriam coming out and saying something as uh, impulsive. And it's not like she's tried other means. She's been communicating at a certain point. They didn't like what she was saying. And um, I believe that if, if a person is a survivor of the worst possible essay, like she has, there needs to be some time and effort put into making sure that she gets exactly what she needs. And unfortunately, that did not happen in my view. So when I tried to advocate for her, I now feel like I'm on the blacklisted list and it's not something that I wanted. I was trying to defuse something that I thought was not going in a positive direction. Uh, I don't want to talk about the content because it's not my content to talk about. Miriam is going to say it way better than I ever will, but I just want everyone to know that I support Miriam. I support survivors. I think that the, um, the letter that was sent from the attorney on behalf of the aftermath foundation to uh, down the rabbit hole at, is it was despicable. Uh, it was shameful to watch and, um, and it made me mad. Like people have got to do better than that. I'm not trying to tout either. The best thing people can do if they have uh, a, a situation where there is uh, some sort of disagreement is try to talk through it, try to be willing to listen to the other person and have some inward focus and humility about how you might have done something wrong. Somehow that process failed. And I don't think it was Miriam that was failing at that process. So that's my opinion about it. And I could be completely full of shit, but I'm, uh, that's how I feel, but I'm not going to ignore this. And I, I, I appreciate everyone that kind of stuck around with me till the end. Um, because I wanted to share with you the purpose and the scheduling part of this video, but at the same time, I'm not going to ignore and be tone deaf to the things that are going on in the, the rest of this conversation, because I think it's very, very important. All right. Everyone has stuck around with me for over uh, an hour and 14 minutes. I could not be um, happier to be able to bring this uh, with you tonight. Poor you tonight. Sorry, I've been talking for a while. I'm, I'm probably pretty tired. I got up early, you know, regular work stuff, the kids and all this. So um, I'm getting a little tongue tied. That's just the way it is. Again, thank you for being part of this. I'm going to keep doing this as fast as I can kind of put these edits together. And I'm not doing a lot of editing. What I'm doing is I'm trying to cut out parts from my mom's story that are, um, if she has, she coughs a lot. So I'm trying to cut out some of that just so she doesn't have to, you know, have that as part of her video. 
Um, I'm going to get better at the sound part. I know everyone's like, don't worry about the sound. I don't know. I used to work at Golden Air Productions. So I guess shitty sound at least makes me feel better because I know David's really going to piss him off that I'm getting good feedback with shitty sound. So I'll get better at this process as we go. Um, but I'm just trying to cut out some of the stuff or if she does get emotional or doesn't want to share a specific thing, I'm going to cut that out. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bring something forth that she doesn't want brought forth. Um, anyway, um, thank you everybody. Um, I usually do the little outro, um, with my buddy, Tom. Um, I think that, you know, any good time here spent, uh, picking a Tom is probably good. I also, if everyone noticed, I kind of changed my intro a little bit. Um, I threw Aaron in there because I do think that it, uh, the intro needed to be a little bit more adorable, but I am going to sign off and everyone have a great night. Being a Scientologist, when you drive past an accident, it's not like anyone else. As you drive past, you know you have to do something about it because you know you're the only one that can really help. We were in the middle of our tournament where my friend John said he found a body in the bushes over there. I ran over there because I'm a healing monk to try and help, but obviously my magic wasn't strong enough because the dude's body was missing a head. He or she has the ability to create new and better realities and improve conditions. So my friend decided to try and use a necromancer spell, which didn't work, which I knew it wouldn't. Uh, being Scientologist, you look at someone and you know absolutely that you can help them. And apparently we contaminated the crime scene because that spell uses a lot of glitter. I think it's a privilege to call yourself a Scientologist and it's something that you have to earn. And because Scientologist does 